Hi folks, Irish Trekkie just stopping by to let you know that today's video is brought to you by our sponsors, Starfleet International. Starfleet International is the world's largest and oldest Star Trek fan association, providing a place where Star Trek fans can meet up, get to know each other, have fun and share in their love of Star Trek. I'm a member over here in Ireland in Region 20, so why not help out the channel, jump down to the description box and head over and let them know that Irish Trekkie sent you. And maybe we can meet up for one of their fantastic events. Hi folks, Damien here, aka Irish Trekkie, back with another Nerd Escape podcast. And with me, as always, we have... It's myself, the Trek Collector, Chris T. Judge. How is everyone today? Well, Chris, we're back with some Discovery news again, which is good. It seems to be building up slow momentum. But um, it's always yep. good to have rumours flying around and some images. So we're here today with our news roundup, uh, which should be yes. a fun discussion, to say the least, anyway. So, yeah, it's nice. Positive vibes still coming from Discovery, um, which is great. The negativity seems to be dying down a little bit. But I still reckon there'll be something negative around the corner soon, and the internet will explode again. But no harm. <laughs> of course, of course. As always, as always. When, when you have such fanatic fans for star trek you know it just shows the passion of the group which i can't blame to be honest with you um but don't forget if you want to join in that uh fanaticism come over to our facebook group uh, link is in the description below a uh, fantastic discovery fan page um but to kick things off today chris um we had news that uh, david mack the author of the first official star trek discovery tie-in novel um has completed it um he's done his proofread and he sent it off to the editors it has an interesting title it's called desperate hours what do you think mm. yeah intrigued by the title um the novels never really had too much time to get into any of the star trek novels i have read a few star trek novels i have to say uh, ones with interesting kind of titles. And this is definitely one that I might actually pick up. Be interested to see when this is going to be set. Is it going to be pre the pilot? Or, you know, is it going to give us some background information? Mm. Sometimes we do see this happen with books. Or is it going to be kind of, you know, slap bang in the middle of season one? I, I'd i say probably it could be maybe pre. I don't know, by a title like that, it could be pre. Because I think yeah. we're... we're it's looking like tensions between the Federation and Klingons. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. desperate hours, yeah. Could be a little backstory, which is always kind of great. And as passionate fans, just as you said there, out there that will read this novel and, you know, will give us more insight to uh, Discovery. But uh, the, the, the release date of this book now will be interesting. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I, ca I can't remember. I don't think there was one out there. Um but it, it would be interesting to see when that's coming out. But I'm glad that there's going to be a tie-in. Um, but we've had our videos in the past where we've kind of ran our theories through. And as you mentioned, the conflict between the Klingons and the Federation, I think, is pretty much a given now at this stage. So um, with Desperate Hours, I, I'd like it to be a prequel leading up to this. So, like, what happened? This, de like, Desperate Hours looks like it's going to be a small time scale where something crazy happens. And then, boom. Star Trek Discovery starts with, you know, the Shenzhou or the Discovery getting up to all sorts of shenanigans. But that's good, anyway. Yeah. We have yeah. to uh, I, th I think it always works as well when you're trying to, to launch kind of novels related to a TV series like this. Kind of, if there is this one kind of incident that's brought up in the pilot episode hmm. that uh, a novelist or a writer can go back and actually expand on that story is always great for the fans. And especially the Star Trek community kind of love that. So, yeah, it'd be fairly, fairly interesting. And it can bring a big success for novels in that collection. So, yeah, hopefully, I agree. I, I would like to see a prequel. Good stuff. And the way CBS are, they're mad for making money left, right and centre. So I'm sure they're wanting this to be a success. And hopefully, following the book, there'll be a lot of merchandise, be it cosplay uniforms, action figures, props, ships, you know, us and our ships. So fingers crossed yeah. that's going to be coming pretty soon as well. The, I think sometimes with CBS, they're a bit slow on the mark. And nowadays, when you look at the likes of eBay and all these cosplay stores out there, like mm. regardless if it's going to be official, um, you do have uh, Rubens, I think, made one set of uniforms, uh, kind of cheap. They did the Beyond stuff mm. or, you know, the JJ Universe stuff. 
not great quality. Yeah, okay, look, they, they were fine. But you do have a lot of sites that do kind of do unofficial stuff, um, fairly more reasonable. What, uh, you know, CBS have thrown all their money in with uh, Avanos. Uh, Av- oh, yeah, God. yeah, Avanos. Brain yeah, yeah. Avanos. And, you know, very, very expensive. Okay, I know the fans kind of, yeah, okay, we're perfectionists Screen and we like things down to. Yeah. Yeah, screen act, but I think, you know, there's I think there's two price ranges there. I don't know whether one company would allow uh, the other one. Yeah, if you want the full screen accurate and nothing against anyone that's gone out and bought those uniforms. I have bought one or two things from that company itself. But, you know, a little bit more hmm. affordable price range could be a good starting point. But again, they just seem to be a little bit slow on this part. So, you know, I can see when Discovery airs fairly quickly, if CBS aren't quick enough, There'll be a lot of cosplay shops, you know, copying these and mm-hmm. happy days for the fans. <laughs> and people making their own as well, fair play to them. With such a oh, major absolutely. society out there, it's great to see. Like, Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, but like the likes of com badges and stuff like that will probably do well. The licensing things is always a huge issue for me when it comes to these things. Like Eagle Moss are doing a very, very good job. I know, you know, there's a few letdowns with one or two ships. You know, that, that does happen in any collection. You've got to remember as well, some of these ships we haven't actually properly seen. They haven't even been on screen for more than probably 30 seconds. Mm. So, you know, it's fairly easy for us fans to take one screenshot and kind of like pull the inaccuracies. But like, I think Eagle Moss have done a great job with the Starship collection, which is great. But there is companies out there that, you know, I just really hope they don't get the license because, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. give the fans quality. You know, it's I'm not being funny. Like, you know what I mean? You know, Star Trek fans aren't five-year-old kids. No. So, you know, you want stuff that's screen accurate or c- close to as possible in a re- well, reasonably... I don't think yeah, that's too fair. That's too much to ask like, for. Good quality. Yeah, Diamond Select toys do all right, but they're not pushing out the stuff as quick as Star Trek fans would like. Mm. Um, you know, I would love to see Bandai get a shot at doing um, models again. I think uh, anyone that has Voyager or any of the Bandai kits... Um, pre-painted with the lighting they will say that, that they're probably the best kits that were ever made um, and that, that they're high detail and like they're going for crazy money now on, the, uh, on eBay um, you know so that kind of level of detail would be great I know as well I know Mobius have been linked with some of uh, the JJ verse stuff yeah. again great model company absolutely fantastic and we know that Polar Lights do have Star Trek stuff and again they do great models um, I think we're looking at a society now as well. Model kits seem to be coming a little bit back. There seems to be a good yeah. buzz on the internet, especially with the 1350 builds. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of fans out there want to see pre-painted kits. If you look at the Eagle Moss, how it's thriving and how well the specials do that are larger ships, I think fans do kind of more want to be lazy and just buy the ship pre-painted with lights. So I definitely think there's a market there for that. There is. like, And again, like Eagle Moss have done very well because... I think they were just at the right time. There was nothing else going on. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. um, you know, are they perfect? No. Um, but no one else has ever done a collection like this. So, like, they have their strong points and they have their weaknesses as well. But that's for another time. Um, but, yeah, yeah <laughs> hopefully hopefully the right licensees get the opportunity to make some quality stuff for fans. You know, because I'm sick. I'm a big Star Wars fan, but I'm sick of going into stores like toy shops and collectibles seeing huge amounts of Star Wars stuff and no Star Trek stuff. I want to see it flip around for a change. It'll be hard, like, push kind of if you look at Smith's uh, toy store, maybe the likes of Toys R Us and stuff like that. Mm. It's going to always be very hard to see kind of like that kind of Star Trek stuff. But a small little space, small little section, yeah, but like, Jesus good mer- merchandise you're always strong bets as the comic book stores or the forbidden planets and stuff mm. like that but you would like to see it. it's kind of been like over the years it's been kind of like it's 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 fading away only when the, the movies come out you might get a little bit more merchandise yeah. the 50 yeah kind of did well we got lots of merchandise but again just make it look cool exactly. and accurate and fair priced exactly exactly so uh, moving on from that, um, the other news that hit as well, um, we had confirmation that episode two is currently being filmed, and um, there was images released there by Ted Sullivan over on Twitter where we had the director's um, card. So we had Adam Kane is the director. So that's yep. good to see, and um, it was interesting that that kind of tied in 
with uh, Chris Obi releasing an image celebrating um, James, James Frayne's birthday over in Toronto where we had pretty much both the Discovery, the Shenzhou and the Klingons uh, all in one place. So obviously, I think it's logical to say, taken from the Vulcans, that, um, you know, episode two covers both crews. I don't think that's yeah. a big leap to say anyway. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, again, though, you don't know whether or what way they're going to film episodes as well. Um, you don't know whether there's going to be any Discovery flashbacks, um, which could be done. You know what I mean? Like um, sometimes you do actually see it. Like so, some of the the, the the flashback episodes will be filmed now. Hmm. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, it looks as though all the cast are together, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, the empty plates. I wonder where they getting a nice uh, Klingon cuisine. Gok. Yeah, you know, yeah. Let's yeah, 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 yeah. to be thrown on the plates. I would have loved to see their faces now if a big ball of Gok arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. Be... Oh no. <laughs> Hopefully, it was like Deanna Troy's triple chocolate cake or something like that for James Rain. That'd be uh, fine. Wash happy, it down with happy, a bit of and... Klingon blood wine. You'll be fine. <laughs> and let, let us say from the Nerd Escape, Happy birthday, James Rain. I uh, hope you had a good one. Yeah. Um, and William Shatner as well today. Exactly. 82, yeah. I believe, yeah. which is uh, fair play to him, you know, keeping on, keeping on. Um, but yeah, like one of the things that popped up about episode two being filmed is, um, is this technically episode three? Because uh, normally the pilots are a kind of two parter um, and we know that's already kind of in the bag now. So yeah. Um, it's nice to see them kind of progressing on, but this could be the second part of the pilot, but it's unlikely. Yeah, I, I doubt. I think pilots now as well, TV networks have kind of learned that this one part, two part or for a pilot doesn't work anymore. So they're just better off just, you know, it's a pilot. So it's a, it's, it's a longer episode, which to me would make a lot more sense. Mm. So hopefully we're going to get a nice 100 minute, 120 minute first pilot episode mm. all in one sync, re- launched in one part. Now, with the CBS Access thing, they might split it uh, and put it as a two-part on CBS's TV network mm. and have the pilot there on All Access, which to me would be something that I would, wouldn't would surprise me with CBS doing. So I think anyone that has CBS All Access will get, and again over here with Netflix, um, will get it in one go. And if you don't have subscribed to CBS All Access... And you don't subscribe to Netflix, you'll have to watch it as a two-parter. Now, that's only a theory by me, mm. but I wouldn't put it past CBS. Because I think they said they were going to air the first three. So does that include the pilot as being a one-parter or a two-parter? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past them. We all know kind of CBS no, anyway. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, uh, well, to me, I hate to say it, if I was kind of marketing there, you know, it's a quick, easy way to... Uh, get people onto CBS All Access or Netflix as well. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, imagine sitting down and watching it and then to be continued, you're like, Ugh. watch it all and now on that. CBS All Access and then you, or you, watch episode you, two next week. <laughs> and then what you got like, going on to Facebook and then anyone that has All Access, oh my God, you know. Did so, you see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if anyone from CBS wants to come on to the Nerd Escape and have a chat about that, by all means, just reach out to us. <laughs> um, not, yeah. But yeah, and and few of those images that Ted Sullivan posted um, were quite dominated by uh, green screens. And that kind of yeah. gathered some momentum in our Facebook group um, that, yeah. you know, virtual sets seem to play a big role, which like before we started shoot, uh, shooting this podcast, we were discussing that. And any mainstream, definitely science fiction show anyway, do rely heavily on you know, virtual yeah. sets like back in TNG days, back in the original series, you'd had a fantastic artistry where they'd kind of paint never ending hallways and looking now in 4K, that'd be completely obvious. So, yeah, yeah, it's cool. The likes of Kronos, I think at one point was like definitely what you call it, like a painting. Um, hmm. Yeah, 4K, it wouldn't stand out too well. <laughs> but like, I, I suppose if you do look, there's nothing new with the green screen. I know people who kind of panic and say, oh, there's no need to panic. Um, you know, we do see the fan productions and, you know, come here, fan productions do a great job. Mm. I've nothing wrong with the fan production green screens, but I think it's safe to say with this production, the green screens will be more kind of in line with the likes of Beyond. So if anyone that was following the likes of Star Trek Beyond would have seen shots done at one point, I think 
the scene with Kirk and the motorbike where they're on that platform, mm. uh, Jayla and Ting, I definitely remember seeing the the CG, the green screen effect and them just standing on the oh, kind yeah. of pillars. We've yeah. also seen it in when the Enter- Enterprise was crashing and into darkness. You just seen the hallway and it was all green screen around it. And mm. um, you've got as well the Avengers and so forth like that. So I'm not concerned about green screens. <laughs> Um, it's it's a different day and age, you know what I mean? It's uh, like it looks really really cool. If it means more money for special effects as opposed to building sets for a one off, I'm for it. And plus as well, there's always that nightmare that has happened over the years with CBS. Unless it's kind of like big Star Trek fans that work on production, these things get dumped in the skip anyway. So you know it's tragedy when you, yeah. you hear this kind of talk. It's just, yeah, so. You know, to me, I don't really mind. I'm not too upset about green screen. I'm sure the bridges will be kind of a concrete set. And we've seen that, Um, though. Like, we had the production teaser, and we definitely saw one bridge, which we surmised to be the Shenzhou. Um, Yeah. And we saw, like, and actually, in all fairness to the production team over on um, Star Trek Discovery, that production teaser showed very large sets larger than i would have initially predicted so it yeah. does look like they have grand scope because they're shooting in some very big sound stages and then we're going to have the addition of the virtual sets as well to enhance yeah. these practical well, sets so i'm actually really excited about that that they're not just yeah going full virtual or fully yeah practical um, it's a combination if if you look at what we thought was the klingon sarcophagus um set you know there's a lot of gaps in between. You see the, the kind of arches coming up. Mm. You know, that could be all green screen at the back. Now, what could that be? Could they just be windows? So that's your space visual effects. And you know what I mean? It'd be kind of nice to see just more than uh, what did they used to use? They used to have uh, the stars on a roller that made the stars look <laughs> as though they moved. So you, you kind of like to see a bit of yeah. nebula, uh, nebuluses and, you know, gases and omnibuses in space. You know, yeah. it's. I think we've moved on from just the... the the black and white of, of space, you know, which yeah. would be kind of cool to see in uh, Discovery, there was, you know. There was. Uh, and there was, that, there was that shot of uh, the bridge, which, no, I could be wrong here, and we were talking about this, but the Shenzhou, and there was actually green screen on the floor. And mm. It got me and you thinking that maybe that's glass, you know, because yeah. we were kind of wondering where the bridge was. We're, yeah, we still haven't figured it out. It could be at the bottom of the ship, um, and it's nothing to say. That's you know thinking, where the phase you know. ball is. Uh, if you look at the TOS Enterprise, um, there's nothing to say. Could could be at the bottom. Uh, that would actually be fairly fairly cool. Coming just, that just popped into my head. There Something actually unique, just thinking you know? about it. Because we yeah, have the glass you're right above the, the green card, screen. Yeah, you know, and um, yeah, Kirk it's... and stuff. Why not have the glass at the bottom so you're looking down? So the bridge, like that, could be really like. Okay, be <laughs> being attacked ventrally or dorsally, you know, you're still kind of being exposed. But, um, you know, it could just be could just be could uh, could be an interesting play on ship design to have the bridge on the ventral section of the. the saucer. Yeah, it's, it's something some, something something different. But you got to re- the, the the great thing as well about Star Trek in one sense when you're building sets is when you look at bridges, mm. and it's been done before and it's been redressed. It's look, come here. I know one or two people have given out about it before, but come here. It's a Starfleet vessel. Most bridges will be standardized. Mm. You know, there's no harm. So, like, if you have the Shenzhou Bridge and you have Discovery Bridge, like, there's not really too much that you'd have to change if there's ships around the same time, mm. in my opinion, anyway. So I've never minded redressed stages. Sure, even when you go back to TOS and you yeah. had the other ships of the fleet, it was the same bridge. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, if, if you even to me, it makes about... sense. If you even think about a more recent example, um, Into Darkness, the Enterprise bridge is the same bridge as the Vengeance, just redressed. Do yeah. you notice that? Like, and it's complete. It looks no, completely it different. Dark. It looks completely different. Yeah, but like but they did a good job, bridge. and I didn't even notice that. Yeah, mm, yeah. You know, so the, a lot can be done with the clever production team there as well. So um, yeah, there's a lot, lot of lot of interesting news uh, in Discovery Land. And you came across a couple of interesting rumors as well. Yeah. In your research for today's was, episode. Yeah, there was one kind of the Frankenstein ship with um, Discovery and the Shenzhou. Um, I don't know about this one now. It, it, it kind of reckons that Discovery and the Shenzhou will be 
kind of it's the same ship it gets damaged it gets either rebuilt is it a mishmash between the two ships um look looking at this one i don't know this this kind of follows on an old kind of rumor that happened in deep space nine so maybe somebody has this hang up that they want to throw two ships together um, I know a lot of people out there kind of looked when they first seen Discovery and went, hang on here, like, you know, um, you know, a Constitution and a Klingon ship together. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not too keen on this idea at all. Um, I don't like it. Um, like, with Deep Space Nine, or sorry, it was Voyager, sorry, um, the Jaeger. Um, the, the story behind it was at one point was Voyager got thrown into the Delta Quadrant and this was initially a production idea that they were playing around with um, which doesn't explain the size of the McKee ship because the McKee ship would have had to be huge to fit onto the back mm. of the Intrepid but it was meant to be that Voyager was badly disabled and the McKee ship was badly disabled so they had to put the two ships together mm. so henceforth the Jaeger was born so obviously a model was created Ugly ship. Uh, it ended up in Deep Space Nine and yes it's a horrendous looking ship now I know some people aren't too much big fans of Discovery would that work and would that make an explanation and would people like the idea to me no, I think when when you look at the Jaeger, it I can understand the concept where they're going, mm. but and sure, like if you look go back to Caretaker, like how were they actually meant to? Oh, maybe it was after the the, the battle with the Kazon, but like how the hell were they meant to put this together? Like what the two ships are just meant to dock together? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know we've seen it in a uh, TAS uh, where the Klingons and the Enterprise joined up together, but that's right, to escape the void zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, just don't know. No, look to me, just have the two. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think a ship is gonna get destroyed. Um, unfortunately, that's yeah. my gut opinion. Um, and I think that's how you get captains. your two. Crews. It would. Ex I know. I know the Franken ship theory would explain two crews, two captains. But um, you know, like you had the theory, and we were kind of working on it that potentially we think the Shenzhou gets destroyed, and the crew yeah. comes over to discovery yeah. you know in some sort of fashion or other maybe michelle's character becomes you know well, the it, xo or something i don't know yeah because if you look at it because we still haven't got a commander named and nope. you know this is holding up wait wait and we know previously before in voyager um when we had janeway and we had captain oh from the equinox and captain starfleet Ransom. protocol captain ransom Starfleet Protocol dictates whoever has the largest ship is in command. So, you know, it could be a matter of size. Mm -hmm. Who takes uh, command of Discovery? Well, we have our captain from Discovery. Mine's so, bigger than yours. <laughs> uh, exactly. So, you know, that could be that could be how we get our commander. Mm. Simple as. Yeah. Two ships, you know what I mean? One ship's destroyed. You know, there we go. And the it. commander, both commanders get <laughs> killed. Yeah. And, like, depending on where they are in... in you know the universe there may not be near a star base there could be desperate hours you know something crazy is going on so they just have to get into the crew and just deal with this crazy situation from the get-go you know yeah well we don't know as we don't know as well if this is set at a time of war as well you got to realize as well does the federation have you know it's not just going to be an, an automatic thing where they go back to starbase and replenish and give michelle yeah. another ship you know it could be the simple fact that they don't have any ships to spare yeah. so starfleet command could just go leave it be you know what i mean sorry you lose your captaincy well you lost the ship yeah. you know what i mean that that's another side of it that could come in she could be court marshaled mm. and the moat yeah. you know as we do know that if you do lose a federation if you, you're captain of a ship and you lose your ship you face a court martial mm. so as i said you don't know what the outcome is the so that yeah. could be another theory as well but like we don't know we, we like we're assuming that it's going to be High tempo between Klingons and the Federation, so maybe Starfleet don't have a ship to spare. Exactly. So it could be simple as that, but I don't like the idea. Like, this has been bouncing around from day one with Discovery mm. and Klingon ship. I just don't like this idea. Um, You know, I think just leave the two ships alone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's let's see ships. where it goes. Let's look back at, yeah, Star, let's like look back at the original series, and there was only ever one Federation ship. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we still don't know too much um about you know, the timeline that it's set in, we don't know, mm. you know, we know that, like, the Enterprise was off on a five-year-long 
voyage of exploration. So, and that's not to happen yet. So, we, like, you know, we're still in early days yeah, of the around on the Enterprise at this time. April, and we know that the Enterprise got refitted um, mm. before each captain. So, you know, when Kirk came along, it's, it, 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 the Enterprise has a different mission to what April has. So I wouldn't be too concerned. Um, the, the fleet could have been deployed completely different back then. Exactly. You, we don't know as well that the situation could be by the time Kirk takes command of the Enterprise, you know, Starfleet might slightly demilitarize after this whole yeah. discovery incident. We yeah. don't know. We don't know. They might want to go for a more peaceful route because this could tarnish the whole purpose of the Federation as well. you got to realize if the Federation are going gun ho with the Klingons, how can you turn around to people and say, do you want to join our United Federation of Planets? We're at war with the Klingon Empire, but we're not warlike. Yeah. They started on us, you know, so... Just ignore that over there. You know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities here that can actually fit in mm. to the TOS canon. That does, to me now, it's starting to make a little bit more sense. We've got to realize, you know, everyone's fixated on the Enterprise. Yeah. The Enterprise is there. She goes through two more refits. So I don't think she's too long out of space dock. So it is. It's April that has the, the big chair. And there's actually a fan production coming out about April coming up soon as well. I'm looking forward to that one actually. Cool Can't remember the name. Yeah. Yeah, the name escapes me as well. We'll have to come we'll have to we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that at some stage when one of the podcasts. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And the other um rumour that was milling about as well was um Archer coming on, ca- ca- doing a cameo on Discovery because Scott Bakula had a bit of a chat at uh, Las Vegas uh, last year, I believe. And yeah. um, what, were you, what were you thinking about that? Well, I just think because Scott is working on a CBS show and people are putting two and two together. Mm-hmm. I like Scott. Um, I liked him as Cap- Captain Archer. I thought he did a great job. Um, to me, though, no, please don't. Um, we've already seen this done before in TNG. It was great to see McCoy uh, with Data. I thought, actually, that was done really, really well. And it very fit in Data and McCoy and the whole kind of... <laughs> Bones kind of having a joke, you know, about the pointed ears. And I thought that that was handed up, handing over the torch really, really well. Mm. Like Scott, Captain Archer would be 130, 140. I don't least, think yeah. realistically, I don't think they're advanced enough at that point that human life can live on till 130, 140 and not look too bad. Secondly, as well, no, I don't, you know, he was Captain Archer, you know, let him be the iconic Captain Archer. Mm. Don't put him dressed up as an old age pensioner, you know, for the sake of being on the show. I'd rather see to Paul. I it would rather see to Paul. Being it makes... yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? It would definitely. But who Get knows? Like, um, Sarek, like, you know, who knows? Yeah, we've got, it's a Paul, we, like, I'm not too sure how the Andorians age. Um, you know what I mean? So, you know, th- th- there's other characters there that can hand over the torch. But I, I think... For me, with Enterprise, I'd like to see my image of Archer kept as it was. Yeah. To Powell, to me, is the most logical sense. Agreed, agreed, agreed. And uh, that kind of brings us up to our news roundup. Um, that's pretty much everything that's kind of in the ether at the moment. But let us know in the comments below if you have any theories or any news about the Star Trek production that you'd like to share. Let us know in the comments below. And do join us over yeah. on Facebook as well. We're there's daily contributions there's such a fantastic community over there um quite a positive community as well which i'm really grateful of uh, because it is a fan page so we're generally all very yeah. positive over there so do join us over there too yeah so let us know as well as damien said let us know what your thoughts on would you like to see captain archer uh, appear in the pilot episode of discovery or would you like to see discovery be a kind of frankenstein ship um cross between two federation ships <laughs> Or that old theory that was going around at the start, Federation and Klingon. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting indeed. Well, listen, that's going to be it for us today. So thanks for stopping by and sharing your day with us. And uh, as always, it's goodbye from me. And a salon from me. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye. Be good. <laughs>